Hello Internet, welcome to Game Theory, the show that dual wields science and logic. Speaking of, that is our topic for today, the gaming trope of dual wielding. You see, this episode is sponsored by Ubisoft and their newest installment in the Assassin's Creed franchise, Valhalla. Available November 10th, click the link in the description to check it out, which is Assassin's Creed, but now with Vikings. And I gotta admit, I'm excited to get my hands on this one, sponsorship or no. It really seems to be the perfect mix of what AC's been building up to all these years. You're setting sail in Viking longships, there's an upgradable settlement feature that serves as your home base, there's massive assaults where you and the crew casually lay waste to huge fortresses, and of course, all the hidden blade action that this series began with. And again, did I mention Vikings? Like, that alone ups the cool factor immediately, though, sponsorship or no Ubisoft, I do gotta knock you guys a bit. Odin! With us. Not really the inspiring or fear-inducing voice of a Viking that I was expecting there, guys. I'm not intending to shade the voice actor or anything. Clearly, this is the direction that the creative team wanted, but for me, I'd think that you'd want to get some Broken Earth voice in there. That's a uh, theater talk for getting your voice low and growly. You know, something like, um, <laughs> Odin is with us! Just saying, this is like one of the only game trailers in existence where we watch as the hero and his team get absolutely wrecked and because our buddy Eivor over here ain't projecting with his diaphragm. Just saying. But what he lacks for in vocal support, Eivor more than makes up for in physical support. Eivor is unquestionably the strongest assassin that we've ever seen appear throughout this series. Throughout this game, Eivor will be dual wielding anything that he can get his hands on. And I do mean anything he gets his hands on. Including things like shields. This announcement was enough to get the internet in a tizzy with headline after headline about this. And so that is what I told Ubisoft that I wanted to talk about in today's sponsored episode. The trope of dual wielding in games. It is super cool, but does it actually make sense? Like, just because you can do something, does it mean that you should? What is the history of dual wielding? Did anyone ever dual wield the way that we're seeing Eivor do in the game? And is there a world, any world in existence where using two shields would make sense? Because, I don't know, just want to know. Also, I'm going to be talking about arrows to cap people because that's something I saw in a Cory X Kenshin gameplay video and I thought it was funny. I took her head off! So now, let's get going, theorists, because Odin is with us! See? It gets you motivated. Consider this my audition for the next game in the series. So let's start with some historical context, shall we? For those who aren't familiar, dual wielding is when you use two weapons, one in each hand. And initially, this seems like it should be a great idea, right? Not only do you look doubly cool on the battlefield, but you're also doubling your offensive capabilities, right? Wrong. Wrong. Think about it. You can only really be offensive with one arm, one weapon, or one side of your body at a time. Which means that even if you are equally effective at using a weapon on both sides of your body, which already is going to be taking a lot of training, half the time that part of your body is just going to be rendered useless, or at least less effective. It's not an efficient strategy, and in a battle for your life, efficiency matters. To boil it all down simply, battles are all about a balance of offense and defense, coming up with solid defenses until it's the right time to strike, which is why throughout history, something used for offense, like an axe or a sword, is so often paired with something focused more around defense, like any of a variety of different shield types. However, that's not to say that there's no historical evidence of dual wielding. Quite the contrary, in fact. If you only have a one-handed weapon, your other arm is entirely useless, and in most cases, nearly anything is better than just your fist. Heck, even something as simple as a stick is gonna provide better defense and longer offensive reach than just your arm. And this this is largely what you see with the history of dual wielding. Most of the time, the technique was used for one-on-one -on -one duels with two different weapons, a longer sword for attacking and a short sword or dagger for defense. In fact, defensive daggers became so popular that the parrying dagger was designed with defense in mind, sporting advanced knuckle guards and cross guards. Turning our attention eastward, the Japanese in the medieval era used shields far more sparingly than their European counterparts. An emphasis on horse archery combined with the unique benefits of the Japanese armor made handheld shields more of a hindrance to the movement than a defensive boost. It was during this time period that the samurai began carrying two different swords, the longer katana for battle and the shorter wakazashi for ritual purposes. However, some sword masters developed a two-sword fighting system using both of these blades. One of Japan's most famous swordsmen, Miyamoto Musashi, developed Nito Ichi, a school of swordsmanship that loosely translates to two swords as one. Similar to European dueling, Nito Ichi utilizes the smaller wakazashi as a defensive weapon and the 
the longer katana as the primary. So dual wielding has some historical precedent, but so far the emphasis has been on one defensive weapon and one offensive weapon. What about what we see in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, where we see Eivor dual wielding two very similar looking axes? And quick side note here, yes, they are clearly different. One is bigger and heavier and would function as the defensive axe, while the other is lighter and probably meant to be the main attacking axe. But the differences between the two isn't likely to be significant enough to change our overall discussion on fighting strategy using two axes, so that's what I'm going to talk about right now. Well, when it comes to dual wielding two of the same type of weapon, the Dimakairi class of Roman Gladiator were specifically trained to use two curved scimitars called Sikai, but this was entirely for the purpose of spectacle rather than tactical advantage. Then there's Thailand's Krabi Krabong, which has a form called Dab Song Mue, which uses two swords, but in my research I wasn't able to find any historical examples of dual wielding axes specifically. That said, perhaps the closest example comes from ancient China and their weapon of the twin hook swords. Remember friends, there is no war in Ba Sing Se. But the curved ends of these swords would be used to trap a weapon or hook the back of a shield to pull it down, exposing your opponent for a solid attack from the second sword. And from there, everything about the dual hook swords was deadly. The knuckle guards were sharpened for slashing and punching, the tail was a sharpened short dagger, certainly an advanced, but very, very cool and very, very deadly set of weapons. From a functional standpoint, Eivor's axes would be a much simpler version of this. The main advantage of the axe is the hook under the blade, so one axe could catch the opponent's weapon or shield, pull it away, leaving the body exposed for the blow of the second axe, just like with the hook swords. That's the good news. The bad news is that axes are just glorified sticks with a heavier head, meaning their defensive abilities and overall reach are incredibly limited. So could you dual wield axes? Sure, you could. Would you want to? Honestly, only in very limited situations where there's almost nothing else to use. And in the Valhalla trailer, Eivor is surrounded by a abandoned boss grip shields, where the grip is inside a protected knob in the middle of the shield. What he should be doing in this situation, instead of looking around with a lot of mood, is picking up the obvious complement to his offensive main weapon. That is, without question, the single best strategic move that he should be making in this moment. Which then, of course, brings up our second question, the shield question. While he's picking up one, why doesn't he pick up two? Is there ever any reason to dual wield a shield? In my research, I couldn't find any historical examples of anyone ever dual wielding shields, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it never happened. Shields are super useful and are incredibly versatile defensive tools, but is there any practical reason to have more than one? Probably not, unless you're in the rare circumstance of being attacked on both sides and are in desperate need of a hasty retreat. Sure, a shield can be used as a weapon like we see in the game, it's just not a good weapon. The benefit of axes and swords and lances and whatever aren't just the sharp stabby bits, though those are certainly perks, it's the fact that they're extending the effective lever of your arm, keeping you out of harm's way while substantially increasing the amount of damage that you can do. A shield, quite simply, isn't doing that. What's worse is that, as you just saw, the most effective way to use a shield as a weapon is by using its edge. If you think about why an arrow or a bullet works, they put all of the pressure on as small of a point as they can, creating a single point of maximum impact. A shield does basically the exact opposite, spreading the force behind it as much as possible. This is great when you're defending and you want to dissipate the energy from an incoming attack, but when you're attacking, it just means that you're going to be making less of an impact over a larger surface area. If you have a single big shield, then yeah, maybe you can use both your hands to drive the furthest point of the shield into your opponent and do some damage that way, but with dual wielding, both of your hands are on different shields and your offensive ability effectively drops to zero. It is literally the opposite of what you want. But what if you had a hybrid weapon? What if you didn't just have a sword, but you had a sword and shield combo? They may just seem like a creation of fantasy games, but there is some historical documentation about shields with spikes sticking out of them appearing during the Dark and Middle Ages. Most notably used by the armies of William the Conqueror, these spiked shields tended to be round, thin, targe-styled shields with the boss of the shield equipped with a massive spike coming out of the center. And considering Assassin's Creed Valhalla takes place in 9th century England, there's definitely a chance Eivor could come across one of these bad boys in his journey. Fun fact, by the way, targe shields were used by English longbowmen for target practice, and that is where the word target actually comes from, the more you know. Anyway, if you want to get even more extreme with your spiked shields, there's the absolutely insane looking lantern shield, which is like the Swiss army knife of shield combat, equipped with not just shield breaker spikes, but all sorts of Assassin's Creed-esque hidden blades popping out of every nook and cranny. This one was a bit late to be used by Eivor, coming straight out
straight out of the Italian Renaissance, but again, if you're looking for an offensive shield, this is probably gonna be the best bet that you find in history, except again, there's a problem with all of these. How are you attacking? Sure, these things may be equipped toe to teeth with spikes, but unless you're charging headfirst into the enemy, leading them straight to a wall, or slamming the spikes down onto an opponent laying in the ground, you're not getting a lot of force behind your attack. From what I've read, the spiked shield was a short-lived trend in history, mostly related to the fact that it was a waste of resources. Look at the battlefield in the Valhalla trailer. Everyone is tightly packed, practically fighting on top of each other. Fighting during this era happened in tight masses of people, and the spikes were meant to control distance and angles from which an opponent could attack. But the spikes became a nuisance quickly in these sorts of battles, either getting in the way, getting caught on various objects, or just poking your allies in the back. So really, any way you slice it, this is just another instance of just because you can dual wield something or slap a bunch of spikes onto something, it doesn't mean that you should. Because here's the real fact of the matter, friends. Forget dual wielding, Eivor should be using ranged attacks for everything. As I mentioned before, in an early peak of the gameplay for Valhalla, YouTuber Cory X Kenshin captured this incredible moment. Oh, throw your shield down, huh? Yeah! Bet you wish you did now. I took her head off with an arrow? My first thought was that there was no chance that this could ever be possible in real life. But then I saw this from the channel ZBG Studios, short for Zombie Go Boom. The key to this decapitation was the arrowhead and the accuracy of the archer. Rather than aiming for the head, the archer aimed for the neck using a mechanical broadhead arrow. These types of arrows contain little winglets inside that expand upon contact with the target, spreading out to two and a half inches wide, or 6.35 centimeters. This extremely large cutting area is over half the size of an average neck, which is 4.77 inches in diameter, or 12.1 centimeters, certainly making it plausible that a well-placed arrow to the neck could absolutely decapitate someone. I used to be a viking like you, but then I took an arrow to the neck. Now, as you can imagine, that fancy type of expanding arrowhead wasn't used back in 9th century England, but you know what was? Its ancestor, the basic broadhead arrow. You see, early viking arrowheads used in battle were exactly the same types of arrows that they used in hunting. Flat, made of metal, and approximately 5 to 7 centimeters long, 5 centimeters wide, and with a barb on both sides designed to cut through skin and stick in the body. As time went on, and armor became more sophisticated, new arrowhead types called bodkins were developed that were longer and narrower, losing the barbs and being designed instead to pierce through chainmail. But as you can see, the enemies Eivor is attacking in Valhalla, with a few exceptions, aren't all that heavily armored. In fact, here you can see his chest and neck fully exposed. Well, unlikely, it's certainly not implausible that with a big enough broadhead arrow and a strong enough bow, Eivor could do ye oldy version of a boom headshot. I mean, the long and short of it is this. Sure, we've seen all the assassins perform nearly impossible acrobatics and show incredible ninja warrior-esque skills when it comes to climbing walls, but none of the others have been able to do the heavy lifting of dual-wielding shields and war axes or decapitating foes with a single arrow. Eivor is just next-level strong and is unquestionably the strongest assassin that we've yet seen in the games, even if he doesn't have the most intimidating voice to match, which then begs the question, how does it all end? How do you stop a guy as strong as this? Well, the the funny thing about Assassin's Creed is that we always have a cheat guide in the form of history. We know that the Viking raids across England caused monasteries to fortify their defenses and move inland away from the reach of the ship-based Vikings, but that wasn't everything. Many historians also tie the arrival of the Christian church in the area to the end of the Viking raids, as the raids didn't keep up with the teachings of the church. And remind me again, who is the main antagonist of the Assassin's Creed series? Oh yeah, the Templars, the most wealthy and and powerful of the Western Christian military orders. Hmm. Looks like there may be no winning at the end of this game, considering that the only thing able to take down a man with the strength of a god is the power of the church itself. I guess we'll just have to find out on November 10th. Click the link in the description to check it out. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. And one final thank you to Ubisoft for sponsoring this video.